How do you get this top off? Hello, good morning. Do you want to grab your coffee and uh, take your seat? Here you are, Ben. Morning. Morning. It's Sunday, the 22nd of March. And in a moment, while Ben's going to minister, and I suppose it's been a funny week for most of us, it's living in sort of completely different times, really. And I don't know where you've been, whether you've been isolated, whether you've been amid all the panic shoppers trying to get those eggs and trying to get those loo rolls. But we're not at the moment, we're in church. Probably a little bit of a different church situation to normal. And it's still church, isn't it? Let's open with a song. about to minister on the cross the cross okay all right if i don't lay hands on you yeah that's fine yeah. okay we're keeping our social distance look there's a guitar width away father god i thank you that church is church regardless of whether we're in a physical building whether we're in a school hall mm. whether we're in a church building whether we're in a cathedral father god yeah. you are everywhere and your spirit is everywhere Father God, I just pray. I just pray you bless this word now, Thank and you God. bless it to the, the, the everyone who's going to hear it. Whether they're going to hear it on a Sunday morning, whether they're going to hear it later, Lord, whether they're going to hear it on a podcast in a year to come, Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you, Chris. That was wonderful. Uh, it's a great introduction. Um, I have um, I have hand sanitized, um, so I'll, but I, I'm kind of getting a bit paranoid about it. So I. Think, am I doing it every 20 seconds? I think some of you have said you think you need to be hand washing every 20 seconds. That's not quite right, but it does feel like it, doesn't it? Um, so I'm going to share in a moment, and um, I, I'm really pleased that I've got Chris here to uh, to, to indicate, to heckle, and to comment, and to make make suggestions. And once we've um, once I've shared 
uh, Chris will just come back in and, and um, kind of cap off what we're doing here and then uh, we'll have the opportunity to go into Zoom so we can talk um, and we can pray and we can just encourage each other. Um, but this has been such a crazy week for me. I don't know about you. It's been crazy at school as a teacher. It's been crazy at home as a family. And it's also been pretty mad thinking about church. Everything has been turned upside down, hasn't it, by what's going on. But God doesn't change. One of the uh, things that came to me was that verse in Hebrews that says, um, I will shake everything that can be shaken. And it does feel a little bit like that, that everything's being shaken. Yeah. So I'm going to talk um, about the achievements of the cross. Now, John was due to do a talk on the letter to Thyatira. But um, please do pray for John. Obviously, he's... He's OK, but he's gone down with quite a heavy cold and he's self-isolating for a while. So he didn't want to be involved even in uh, social distancing filming at this stage. He's up for it, but um, we just might be a couple of weeks time. So it's possible that I might do a talk this week and next week because this is actually a two parter on the cross. What did the cross achieve? So we've had approaching the cross and then we had the heart of the cross from Martin. And uh, on this first one, I want to take a kind of broad brush approach to what did the cross actually achieve. Now, next time, I want to deal with two issues which seem to me to be um, issues that, that aren't talked about enough. So one of them, I'm looking this way because Chris is over here, by the way. He's my audience. So one of them is uh, the new birth, being born again. Chris, are you born again? Yes. He, he says he's born again, which is great. But we'll talk about that more next time. And uh, and the other one is um, healing. And is there healing through the cross? And I feel particularly, given what's going on at the moment, that that will be um, really important. So, uh, so tune in for that one next time. But I just want us to look at Genesis 3 to start with, uh, because a lot of things, of course, begin in Genesis. Why did we need the cross in the first place? So Genesis 3 is, of course, uh, the serpent coming to Adam and Eve. And we know it says, doesn't it, in uh, Genesis 3 verse 1, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And we know that Eve ate the fruit, gave it to Adam, and then they experienced um, they experienced that cutting off from God. They committed the first sin. And the devil is always like this. The serpent is the devil. Um, he basically is deceiving us with everything that he tries to do. And there are so many things that the devil, so many ways the devil tries to come at us. And every time he tries to deceive us, it leads to death. But it always sounds so plausible to start with. But there is a curse that is given to the devil. And this is what I wanted us to focus on. Verse 15, you'll know it well, Genesis 3, 15. Or if you don't, um, turn it up and have a look at this verse. I will put enmity, I'm reading from the New King James, so again, you might need to look at your version. I will put enmity between you and a woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, this is God talking to the serpent. In here, we get a glimpse of how God is going to save mankind. He's talking to the devil and he says... I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. So um, the seed of the woman is going to be Jesus. And where it says he shall bruise your head, that is effectively the devil being defeated, or at least a suggestion that one day the devil is going to be defeated. And where you shall bruise his heel, that is the man, Jesus, suffering. And that is what's happening on the cross. So we get that glimpse of the gospel there. So Leon Morris said this about, about Jesus. He has stood in our place and we may go free. No matter how sin be understood, Jesus is the answer. And he also says this, Christ stepped into our situation. So he became our substitute. And that's what was achieved on the cross. And he wrought atonement there where we were, not in some imaginary situation where we were not. Now, I just want to talk for a little bit, a short while, 
Um, I'm saying this to Chris just to emphasise, so he doesn't fall asleep over there. He's had I'll a long, go, um, he's had a long day, yeah, and he's he's doing another song later, so that might motivate you to stay, uh, <laughs> or not, as the case may be. Let's <laughs> curtail it now. Right, yeah. um, but uh, Roger Price's uh, book, of course, Roger didn't write the book, but um, the transcription um, of the book, he talks. This is a really good book on salvation, and he talks about. You may be able to see it there. You may not. It might be dazzled by the um, by the light. It possibly is. But um, he talks about a barrier and he says there are six blocks between us and God. The first one is sin. The second is the penalty of sin. And then we get spiritual death. And then we get God's character, uh, man's good deeds and temporal life, which is basically that we will all die. Those things all get in the way of us coming to God and they all needed to be dealt with at the cross. But notice that sin is that first thing that needed to be dealt with and John Stott says that the Bible views human death um, not as a natural event but as a penal event in other words uh, and students always laugh when I use that word uh, if I if I do uh, link to penalty they always think it means something else but uh, not a natural event but a penal event in other words that death is a punishment and we don't see that in the world, is that we see that as something natural, but actually it was never meant to be. We were never meant to die. It was only because sin came into the world that we um, that we experienced death. Uh, Romans two says, "In accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, this is verse five. You're treasuring up for yourself wrath." And that's what we've been doing by our sin. So Jesus had to die on the cross. It was the core of his mission. This is what he achieved. And when he died, he dealt with sin. Just to quote Roger, he said, sin is not the decisive issue anymore as Christ died for our sin. Now the word sin, of course, is very unpopular nowadays. The original meaning of it, that many of you may know, is that um, when you shoot an arrow at a target, you don't shoot it hard enough and it drops short of the target and doesn't hit the bullseye. So if we think of it as a falling short, maybe that makes a little bit more sense. And sin can be argued away. You can say, oh, no, no, it wasn't me. It was my awful childhood that I had. It was my parents. I blame them. That's why I'm the way I am. Or we can look at someone else. I'm not looking at anyone else here because it would be a bit pointed. And we can say, oh, he's much worse than me or she's much worse than me. Call me bad. They're much worse than I am. Mm. And and we think, well, I can't be that bad, you know, because we compare ourselves to other people. Or we can rationalise our sin. We can explain it away. We can justify it to ourselves uh, by thinking, oh, I've had a I've had a terrible day. Um, or by or by thinking, well, actually, I'm, I'm doing it for this reason. I'm doing it for unselfish reasons. Or we can say, oh, I'm just not myself today. Sorry, um, I'm just not being myself. Of course, the truth is when we when we're caught doing the wrong thing, we're more ourselves in our natural selves than when we do the right thing, because as as humans, we are naturally sinners. That's what the Bible teaches. It's, it's not a palatable um, thing to hear but it's what the bible teaches we're made in god's image so there is that spark of divinity in each of us but at the same time we are bowed down we are weighed down by sin until we come to the cross i love what c.s lewis says here about sin because we often think that over time uh, sin just kind of disappears and it's forgotten about but Lewis says, we have a strange illusion that time cancels sin, but mere time does nothing either to the fact of the guilt of a, sorry, either to the fact or the guilt of a sin. Sin is washed out not by time, but by repentance and the blood of Christ. So, so yeah, okay, so, so we know that sin then is this serious problem, it's this serious barrier. But again, some of us think, well, actually the sins I commit aren't particularly bad sins. That is true that there are levels of sin, there are worse sins. I spoke to a student today who um, admitted we were reading a story about they're called The Hitchhiker by Roald Dahl. Um, I don't want to give, spoil the end of the story, but that was the context. Um, and uh, the boy admitted that he'd lifted two exercise books from his history classroom and taken them home and he was using them for his own nefarious ends, drawing, writing, 
um, all sorts of things like that. And he was quite proud of himself that his teacher hadn't noticed he'd taken them. Didn't seem to be quite so aware that, that he'd actually stolen. Um, so so, so there's, there's that sort of thing. Obviously, thinking about taking something is one thing, and that's still wrong. But then taking it is on a whole new level. Now, I suppose this lad had um, not only taken the books, but had had to uh, beat up his history teacher to get the books and in leaving the classroom, trampled over a student as he left. That would have been even worse. Do you agree, Chris? I think so, yes. Yeah, it would have been, it would have been unusual, to be fair. Uh, <laughs> but it, but it, would have been, it would have been worse. I was modifying an illustration that Wayne Gruden uses uh, there. But he talks about um, your neighbour's car. So you might want your neighbour's car and then you might steal your neighbour's car and then you might possibly biff your neighbour on the nose to uh, take his car and in escaping run someone over. That is obviously much, much worse. But they're all sin in God's eyes and they've all got to be atoned for. That's what Jesus did on the cross. It's just worth thinking and always worth thinking, do we fully appreciate the awfulness of sin? Have we got our heads round it? And the more we think about it, the more I think about it, the more I realise how much I'm grateful for what Jesus has done. Um, Paul Wells, who's written a very good book called Cross Words on the Cross, um, has said that three problems with sin. First one is that it's an attitude of the heart and it's at the root of everything and it makes us go in the wrong direction. So until we come to the cross, we're always going in the wrong direction. The second thing is we are rebelling against God. And that is something that we don't always realise until we understand that Jesus died on the cross for us. When we see how much pain he had to go through, when you see the abandonment he suffered, we realise that our sin was an awful thing. And the third problem, and this really links in with what we've been doing here um, with coronavirus and the issue, is that far, far worse than coronavirus and other even more infectious and, and appalling diseases, sin pollutes. Now, if I was trying not to taint Chris with my sin, he'd have to be a good deal further away from me than two metres because we bring other people down with our sin and we infect other people with our sin. It's catching. Sin is contagious. That's why we're not supposed to hang around with gossipers and backbiters and murmurers. And if you hang around with an angry person, you're going to catch their anger because sin is contagious. We can't over time gradually drift into being a good person. We had to be rescued at the cross. So in the final section of what I'm going to say, uh, and I'm listening out for Chris's yawns. And he's, he's <sighs> oh, there we are. There we are. He is, he's still awake. He's still awake. Um, just list fairly briefly eight things oh no I think it's nine that the cross achieved that sounds a her terrible <laughs> list doesn't it but some of them are going to be very quick so firstly on the cross Jesus was our substitute um, he took our place and um, it says in 2 Corinthians five twenty one, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him Theologians have a really hard time, in fact all of us, have a really hard time getting our heads around God, who's perfect, becoming sin. Carrying, in other words, carrying the weight of our sin on him. He became our substitute. But not only that, and don't forget um, the uh, barrier that we had with the penalty of sin as well as sin itself. Jesus died the death that we should have died so that we could be redeemed. Paul loves the word grace. Chris has preached through Ephesians, or nearly preached through Ephesians. The word grace pops up, doesn't it, Chris? Once or twice. Once or twice in Ephesians. Basically, whenever Paul uses the word grace, he is talking about salvation through Jesus' death on the cross, uh, through his death and resurrection. Uh, so, so grace is always meaning that salvation. It wasn't just Jesus' good moral life that saved us. Some Christians think this or some some people think this and hold this that it was Jesus example of a death on the cross which shows us how we're to live sacrificially but it's not that God wouldn't have asked Jesus to die on the cross simply to set an example he was achieving something through uh, his death on the cross thirdly uh, 
Jesus propitiated God's wrath. That's a bit of a mouthful. So Jesus took away God's anger on behalf of all the sin and the awful things that we have committed to each other. I think it's Wayne Grudem who said this quote here. God is the ultimate standard of what is just and fair in the universe. And he agreed that the atonement would take place in this way and that it did, in fact, satisfy the demands of his righteousness and justice. I have to say, I thought, oh, this is a simple subject, the cross. The more I've read about it, the more I've thought about it, the more I can't quite grab hold of what it was that God did. But but the cross is such an awful thing. Isn't it? When you read through the accounts in the Gospels of Jesus dying on the cross, when we it starts to dawn on us the horror of it. And Christians try to sanitise it. We try to clean it up. Or we try to go into how gory it was and how painful it must have been. We like people picturing the blood and the, and the nails and the thorns. And I, I'm not sure that either of those really plumb the depths of the horror of Jesus dying on the cross because it was that cry that he cried out my God my God why have you forsaken me it was that moment where all the sin of the world was on him and where the father couldn't look at the son because he was carrying that burden for us and that was what Jesus was doing he was propitiating God's wrath he was making a way where there was no way and this was the only way it could ever have been done so as well as that, as well as the penalty, um, and I, I can only touch on this and I'm going to speed up a little bit now in terms of these points. This is the fourth one. Um, we are justified. We are declared righteous. Now, this is important, actually, because there's a difference here between and I'm, I'm looking at Chris just to make sure that this makes sense. Um, and he hasn't nodded yet. So I'm just looking to see if he nods. Um, a pardoned criminal um, walks away from from a court if, if he's been pardoned he's still feeling a little bit of stigma attached to him yeah because he's been pardoned for a crime <laughs> thank you Chris he's been pardoned for a crime it's been a long day for me as well um but he's been pardoned for a crime but oh, sorry it's only the morning isn't it what am I yeah, yeah 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 it's a Sunday yeah. morning, it's we Sunday morning. Sleep yes that's right yeah um he's been pardoned for a crime and yet um so, so he's got off the punishment but people are still going to be talking about it he's still carrying that people are going to look at him and say he did that but that's not what happens to us as sinners, because we become righteous. Jesus wipes the slate clean and gives us his righteousness. So we take the robe of righteousness that Jesus gives to us. So that is an amazing thing. And then he reconciles us. He brings us together. Um, 2 Corinthians 5, and I meant to turn this up, which is a, an astonishing passage. Verses 18 to 20 says this. All things are of God, who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So the most difficult job of all was to reconcile me to God was to reconcile you to God. That was the hardest job. And once Jesus achieved that on the cross, then any other reconciliation, whether that be, uh, whether that be brother to brother, <laughs> whether it be mother to daughter, any reconciliation you can think of, country to country, can all be achieved because Jesus died on the cross. It does not mean it will all be achieved, um, in this world until Jesus finally brings everything to an end and ultimately there will be that reconciliation but of course there will also be judgment but this is the hope that there can be reconciliation through the cross. Ephesians 1.10 says in the fullness of the dispensation of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ. So there is hope there if you're listening this morning and you're thinking there's something that's never going to be solved never going to be sorted Ephesians 1.10, one, one day all things will be gathered together in Christ. So the sixth thing is the glory of God is shown amazingly at the cross. And I just leave that with you just to say that the glory of God is shown there more than it's shown in any other place in the Bible. 
um, there are some amazing instances of God's glory. Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Go back into the Old Testament. Moses saw the glory of God. Um, in the book of Revelation, we see Jesus in the end times. So we see him with his head and hair like wool, his eyes like fire. But even that is not as glorious as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. So then seventhly, and I'm coming, coming, uh, drawing to a close now. Seventhly, and I've got three more points to go, but they'll be quick. The justice of God. The cross displays the justice of God. And we have to take that on trust because lots of people think, no, that wasn't a just thing. Why would a father send his son to die? That's cosmic child abuse. Um, some people have said that. But actually, if God is God, then we have to be obedient and bow before him and just marvel that the justice of God was met at the cross. And that means there will be justice for every wrong that is ever committed. And then eighthly, the wisdom and power of God are displayed at the cross. Uh, I talked a little bit when we did approaching the cross. If you look at 1 Corinthians 1, you'll see a lot about the wisdom of God and the foolishness of, of the cross um, being also God's wisdom. Now, the ninth point, in a way, is, is my favourite. The cross conquers all evil. And this is a great quotation here. By Jesus' life, death, resurrection and ascension, Christ triumphed over Satan and sin and every conceivable force of evil. Remember, we looked at Genesis 3 where it talked about he shall bruise, um, he shall, he, he, he shall bruise his, I'm getting it the wrong way around now, he shall bruise his heel, you shall bruise his head, that way around. But basically Satan's head has, is going to be crushed, ultimately will be crushed. And the cross is the sign of that. He's still active, but he is defeated. Amen? Amen. He's defeated. Calvary represents the decisive victory. What did Jesus say on the cross? He said, it is finished. So the atonement is the crucial doctrine of the faith. Jesus had to die on the cross. What he did there, taking our sin, was foundational to what we believe as Christians. We sometimes wonder whether Christians who... Um, struggle with the cross who don't like to think about it or maybe those who haven't quite made it through to faith but are on the fringes who are listening who are interested but never seem to have had that encounter with God perhaps haven't seen what Jesus did on the cross um, Jesus said in Luke 12 24 strive to enter through the narrow gate for many I say to you will seek to enter and will not be able why will they not be able? Because they've not come through the cross. I love Leon Morris's quote. We would not know the reckless sacrificial love of God were it not for what is revealed in the cross. As nothing shows us so plainly as the cross what kind of men we ought to be. So let's just take a moment quietly to acknowledge what God has done for us on the cross and i just want to read a verse that heidi actually read last week and i already had it queued up here to share it's matthew 11 27 to 28 and i remember that she has got it written out on a piece of card come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest take my yoke upon me and learn from me for i am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning, and we take your yoke upon us, and we thank you that you have taken our burden away. How can we ever thank you enough? Amen. It's not just about the manger where the baby lay. It's not all about the angels who sing for him that day. It's not all about the shepherds on the bright and shining star. It's 
not all about the wise men who traveled from afar. It's about the cross. It's about my sin. It's about how Jesus came to be born once, so that we could be born again. It's about the stone that was rolled away. Someday, it's about the cross. It's not just about the good things in this life I've done. It's not all about the treasures or the trophies that I've won. It's not about. The righteousness that I find.